Is high density the answer to successful urban districts? Obviously, I much prefer urban life, but I understand that suburban life might be for some people. So I want to preface this video by saying that this is not a debate between urban and suburban. But assuming that we want to create the best urban areas, we can move on to Jane Jacobs fourth and final condition. To recap, we've gone over her previous conditions, the need for mixed uses, short blocks, and aged buildings. Her fourth condition is the need for concentration. High population density is literally necessary to be considered urban, and her fourth condition is a district must have a sufficiently dense concentration of people for whatever purpose they may be there. This includes people there because of residence. So when we think of cities, large cities, of course there's a high population density. After all, downtown districts need it to function properly and it's a key component of walkability. At the most basic level, a high concentration of people enables populated streets that have many users and watchers, making them safer and livelier streets, a more diverse population that differs in their behavioral patterns, and enough patrons to support local establishments at different times of the day. An enterprise that takes up a lot of room yet involves very little people does nothing to aid liveliness or diversity. And of course, even if you have a very dense neighborhood, without the mixed uses, walkable neighborhoods, and a diverse population resulting from aged buildings, the city won't be successful. So back then, when Jacobs was writing this book, there was some resistance to high density because of the anti-slum movement. People then thought that density meant overcrowding, poor living conditions, and breeding grounds for epidemics. But high density is not to be confused with overcrowding. Overcrowding refers to too many people living in one dwelling. This is an example of overcrowding and low density, while this scenario is high density with no overcrowding. Today, people don't generally hold the opinion that density leads to poor living conditions, rather the opposite actually. Some people are opposed to density because they think it means super tall buildings. Now the tallest building in Manhattan is the One World Trade Center, standing at 1,776 feet and there are a handful of buildings that are over 100 floors. You may have seen ultra-tall, ultra-skinny skyscrapers in New York. These are possible today with advancements in engineering. The more land costs, the taller developers must build to achieve their desired return on investment. Say you have this 100 square meter plot of land. If you build a single story building, you can get rent from a total area of 100 square meters. If you build a second story, you can collect rent for 200 square meters, and so forth. But this is only efficient up to a certain point. The height of buildings is limited by the material, so a wood frame building can only be so high. Steel and concrete buildings can be much taller, but the marginal costs begin to decrease after 30 stories. Why is that? Well, skinnier buildings allot more percentage of their floor area to stairs, corridors, elevators, and mechanical equipment. Because of the really dramatic dimensions of these uber skinny buildings, there are more physical constraints, such as a limited number of elevator shafts, which means it can serve a limited number of people. Thus, it makes sense that developers would choose to put one unit per floor, even one unit for multiple floors, to keep the building exclusive. These extremely tall buildings, therefore, require extremely high rental rates and sale prices, like crazy expensive. These buildings are tall, but they're not dense, and they're definitely not overcrowded. At the end of the day, these buildings, being super tall, have nothing to do with wanting density and everything to do with profit. I think 99% of us can agree that these ridiculously skinny and tall 100-story residential buildings are kind of atrocious, but perhaps you're opposed to density in the form of 30-story buildings. Now, there are those people who are opposed to the concrete jungle. I totally agree that perhaps you don't want your cities to become like New York or Tokyo, but we need only look at European cities to see that density doesn't have to equal skyscrapers and no nature. Paris is a low-rise city, and yet it is the most densely populated major city outside of Asia with a population density of 20,000 people per square kilometer. And of course, Paris is a huge city, but this little city of Veve in Switzerland has a population density of 8,270 people per square kilometer, and I personally found it to be quite vibrant and walkable. That being said, a high density city doesn't have to be full of skyscrapers. So you get my point, density is not the same thing as height, when we can have dense urban areas in cities like this, but we can also have dense urban areas with low-rise buildings. In summary, the fourth condition for urban areas is high density. 
But just as density doesn't mean overcrowding, density also doesn't necessarily mean uber tall concrete jungles. And yes, there is such a thing as too much density, and this occurs when the density begins to repress diversity rather than promote it. It comes down to profit. She says, all those variations that are of less than maximum efficiency get crowded out. As soon as the range and number of variations in buildings decline, the diversity of population and enterprises too is apt to stay static or decline instead of increasing. And as always, all four of these conditions need to be present for a successful neighborhood. Well, we've come to the end of our Jane Jacobs series. And when it comes to urban areas, I think Jacobs' principles are still extremely relevant today. Though some examples she uses in her book are a bit outdated and perhaps the circumstances are different now, these four principles are something I always think about when I'm walking on a street. I can't help it now. Thanks for watching, and as always, I make my videos more as a conversation starter, so feel free to leave your comments and arguments below.